Beloved, we return again. As Pastor Jay said last week, we return to the familiar, to a beginning. We return with new eyes, with new minds, and with new hearts. We return with a new hope in this season. But every now and then, with a return, there comes a reversal. We stumble upon a roadblock while returning and must turn back to find a detour to restore us to our original route. You see, to talk about peace, we must sometimes reverse and take a detour to truly understand the complicated nature of peace. Because peace is not straightforward. If it was, we would have already arrived at our destination rather than having to turn around due to another roadblock we find ourselves facing in our lives. The path of peace takes us down a long and winding road. It travels through our worries, through our doubts, trials, through our pains, through our sufferings, until we begin to prepare for our return. Real peace is taking a reversal down that long, winding, and hard road to restore us back to our destination. In this long and winding road back to the familiar return, we are reminded that we are in the season of something to come. We are in the season of something to come. The literal Latin etymology of the word advent is ad, meaning to, and venere, meaning come, making the word adventus, or arrival. With something coming, and anticipation building, we must do something. So therefore, there comes a preparation. We must get to things ready for the arrival of something familiar and something new. This preparation can be a physical preparation. This past weekend, we put up wreaths and decorated here in this space. We put up nativity scenes in our own homes, in our own houses, and love that. We cleaned the church to prepare. Or if you were my family, the day after Thanksgiving, you come together to decorate the Christmas tree in your house. We decorate the Christmas tree in my family while listening to John Denver and the Muppets album, A Christmas Together. <laughs> we watch the Polar Express, we drink hot chocolate, and we have a joyous time. We dance, we sing, and we laugh together. But I am reminded, as we put up ornaments on the tree every year, of the memories attached to each one. We tell the story of every ornament, and we laugh, and we sometimes cry, because it might have been a hard year, and that ornament is more sentimental than it was before. We prepare through our laughter, through our tears, through our dancing, through our singing, Aside from this physical preparation for the season, there is also a mental and spiritual preparation that must happen. You see, for some of us here, this time of year is rough. Some for the first time, some for all times. Some of us prepare for a painful time during the holiday due to the loss of a loved one over this past year. Some of us are receiving hard news which can seem more difficult to hear while we anticipate, such, anticipate in such a joyous season. Other, others of us prepare for stress at this overwhelming time of year. We may not be able to push this back, this stress and this pain, but through these emotions, we remember why we prepare. We prepare to be ready for the things that come for an arrival. Therefore, we prepare so that we might encounter hope, peace, joy, and love. We prepare for the, and anticipate the arrival of Christ, the second coming. 
The gospel lesson this morning brings us a preparation. This preparation comes from the words of John the Baptist. John takes his words and is prophesied by the prophet Isaiah way beforehand, crying out, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. John is ready for the peace of the Lord to come and is telling everyone to prepare. But later on in the passage, when the Pharisees and Sadducees come to watch John baptize others, John becomes irate, telling them that to encounter the Lord, what the Lord is bringing, they must prepare and change, not just sit in expectation for what is to happen. In order to fully understand peace, we must prepare to hit these roadblocks and change our course because the path to peace and understanding is not easy. We must take the words from John and encounter them in our own lives today. I'm reminded of a story of Edward Hicks, a Quaker and an artist in the early 1800s. Quakers are also known as the Society of Friends, and they focus in signs of outward and inner peace. Hicks was known for his paint shop, painting at carriages and signs mostly, although his Quaker friends and Quaker congregants did not quite agree with his signs, for they saw them as too vain and too lavish. So he later sold the shop. And after a failed attempt at trying to live another life, he returned back to painting. But this time, focusing on a particular religious image. You see, during a highly contentious time in his denomination over socioeconomic division, he began to paint images of the peaceable kingdom found in Isaiah 11. In the 1820s, he did the first set of the now 62-piece Kingdom series. These first sets were rough artistically, as he was still trying to hone his craft, but began to connect his own context with the scripture. And in this first set, he drew prominent Quaker William Penn arranging a treaty of peace with the Native Americans in the background to address tensions during this time. Those tensions dealing with both ideological and socioeconomic issues, and eventually they boiled over in the great separation of 1827 when the Quakers split and his Kingdom series paintings became more volatile. His paintings in the next set began to feel like propaganda. As the background of the peace treaty was replaced by historic Quaker elders meeting the new leaders of a newly created branch of his denomination, This set and the one that followed became inconsistent in quality, and each painting was more expressive than the last. This was shown through the change of size of the lions, the leopards, and the wolves, and all of the beasts that were there as they were enlarged. Their eyes also moved from the ground to up and out of the painting, looking alert, aggressive, and rabid. Occasionally, these animals were in conflict, which removed them from their once peaceful state that they were in. The mood of these paintings then shifted again in the 1840s when Hicks saw that the tension amongst the Quakers was never going to resolve. The animals began to look aged and weary, representing the pain and tension that Hicks had seen throughout his entire life. He kept producing the Kingdom series until the end of his life, and died while finishing up one of these paintings for his daughter. Throughout his entire kingdom series, Hicks was never able to capture the peaceable kingdom without the tensions of the world. And I wonder, I wonder if Hicks' story echoes a similar time we are in right now, right now in the church, a time in which we are challenged by those who understand God's word differently from our own a time in which we are struggling to hold it all together, a time in which we are striving for peace, but our lives are clouded with tension, conflict, grief, and pain. We want to make something beautiful, but our vision is heavily criticized by other parts of the church. But we have to remember that Hicks' story 
in our own story does not end with the closing of his shop and that criticism. Hicks continued through that pain, through that tension that he was dealing with not only internally but in his denomination and that criticism and he created something beautiful, a series that resonated with him and gave him a real peace that only he would understand as he got older. The word from Isaiah this morning understands that this peace is not so straightforward as we might think. It offers this beautiful image of the wolf lying with the land, lamb and the imagery that Hicks drew from, talking about a divine peace between predators and prey. Everyone hears these verses loud and clear and embraces the goodness of peace. And it seems so simple, but what we tend to forget is the part in the middle, verse 4. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. I love the overall imagery of this passage. But every time I read and hear this verse, I get stuck. And I can't move past it. I can't move past it because it is violent. It's dark. And it's strong language for an otherwise beautifully crafted and peaceful passage. This past Thursday, I had the great opportunity to sing in Seminary Singers, a choir composed of seminary students at Marsh Chapel, Boston University School of Theology. And I attended the lessons and carol service there where I sang singing that choir, and I noticed that this piece of scripture had been listed as one of the nine lessons we would be reading that evening. So as it was read, I sat there, and I anticipated, and I prepared to hear those words and get stuck, get hung up, but I didn't. I didn't get stuck. I didn't get hung up because I didn't hear it. When I looked down at the bulletin, I noticed that they had chosen to omit that verse. I read it through on the bulletin, and I thought about how simple it made this idea of peace. Wait for the Lord, trust in his mercy and grace, and peace will come. What I learned from hearing this version of scripture was that peace sounds so simple if you remove the roadblocks. But by doing this, we ignore the complexities of life. We ignore the things that turn us around and force us to reflect on the promise of peace and what is actually happening in our world. It is not wait for the Lord and peace will come. It is seek the Lord, understand what the Lord is doing, and you will encounter peace. We must understand the hurt, the pain, and the suffering in our own lives to see that the Lord is working through that pain with comfort, love, and peace in our lives. We must then act on that love and encounter the peace that Christ has brought to the world. Because real peace, real peace is a reversal, a reversal that pushes back against pain, injustice, war, and suffering, oppression, It forces us to turn around and evaluate our lives and push us to act further to get to peace. Real peace is a preparation, a preparation for encountering the love and the peace of God in the world. Real peace is the coming of Christ so that we might experience what Christ is doing in our own lives and world. Real peace is a freedom, a freedom from present suffering, from present pain, from present grief, from present sadness, a freedom that allows us to be restored in our love for one another and a restoration of God's love in the world today. Finally, real peace is a return. It's a return, a return back to the familiar which we gather here for today, a gathering in remembrance, a 
a return back to the familiar story to learn about hope, peace, love, and joy. That's what real peace is. Thanks be to God. Amen.